Hi everyone and welcome to Huddle in Place within the Nine Sided Circle. Actually, I'm wrong. We're doing our Sunday talks. Our Huddle in Place talks are long gone. You can check out our Huddle in Place playlist for 60 episodes of that. But here we are on another Sunday night doing our group talk. And I'm one of your hosts. I'm Nora Kyle, along with your other host, which would be me, Mushtaq Ali. Yeah, and uh, what are we talking about tonight, Mushtaq? Tonight we're talking about uh, existential weirdness with uh, the idea of Sufism and Gurdjieff and Ospensky and the fourth way and the work and especially the uh, inner circle of humanity. Spicy. Mm. Oh, okay. we have a few announcements before that. Yes, and first of all, we just want to invite you to subscribe to us if you'd like to see more of our content. You may have been here before. That's great. If you're new, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, if you enjoy this video, remember to like it. If you don't like it, let us know with a thumbs down. Leave a comment. Add some input of your own so we can have a conversation going because that's what we're all about. We really enjoy participation, questions, feedback, your own ideas, what you're contemplating. Let us know. What are some of our announcements right now, Mushtaq? Uh, the most important announcement is it's going to be formally announced tomorrow with emails and huge ads and all of this kind of stuff. But for right yeah. now, I will tell you guys that we are going to be offering, uh, because the virus is not going away, and because people need to have something to do to work on their health and their fitness and all of that during these times of lockdown and horribleness and plague and zombies and everything, uh, I am going to be teaching an online Bagua Zhang class. Uh, which will be basically by donation, um, you know, give something if you have it. If you don't have nothing, then give us your good thoughts. Um, it will be one lesson a month, and it's specifically going to be on uh, the teachings of what, what are called the mother palms, which is like the as far as we know, the oldest uh, kind of Bagua out there. And it's really good for health and energy and fitness. And it's a lot easier to learn than the palm changes and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be focusing on the mother palms and on specifically circle walking, which is the heart of Bagua. There is no Bagua without the circle walking. And so we're going to be looking at that specifically as an exercise to make you feel better, to boost your immune system, to do all of these things that it does. And we're going to ignore all of the fighting stuff because I can't teach that online. So there is that. And I'm very excited about this because it may turn out to be pretty darn good. Yeah, and this is in, in addition to the stick fighting class that Mishtak is already teaching. Yeah, weekly. which is going great guns. Yeah, so it's it's similar in format, as Mishtak said. So if either of those are interesting to you or both of them, feel free to participate. That's what it's all about. Yeah, yes. yeah this, is, this is something that um, during these times when we can't do anything, if you have like uh, six or eight feet of space, you can walk in a circle. Uh, yeah. And it'll make you feel better. Yeah. Aaron says he's excited about the circle walking. It's yeah, like, it's, it's good yeah. stuff. And it's kind of interesting timing. We did not think of this until after the fact, but we've been watching Avatar The Last Airbender for the last few weeks. And the main character in the series does Bagua Zhang as, Bagua Zhang as his art. And uh, yes, Bagua yeah. Zhang is airbending, so, according to the stories, which I got a complete and total kick out of. I was yeah. wildly geeked. So that's been very entertaining for us and just a fascinating, you know, dovetailing of things going on outside 
So that's what we got going on with that. Do we have any other announcements? Um, look for more announcements in the near future. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, great. So do we want to jump into the talk? Let's jump into the talk. Cool. Let's do it. All right. Shall I start? Go for it. Okay. You sure you don't want to start? I'm sure. Okay. Yes. Then I'll start. Um, so. Zainab. It's Zainab. Yep. here real quick. Welcome, Zainab. You're just in time. Great. So. Just at the turn of the 20th century, G.I. Gurdjieff shows up in Europe. He shows up in Russia first. And he brings a heretofore unknown in the West teaching. And he gets a lot of uh, very interesting people as students. And he teaches until he dies. And then some of his students attempt to carry on. Um, and there are a few things that happen. Probably the most interesting thing is Peter Ospensky, uh, who is considered by many to be his top student. He wrote In Search of the Miraculous and The Fourth Way and all of these books. And uh, at first, he really raved about Gurdjieff, and then he broke with them. And uh, he felt Gurdjieff had hinted that there, is, there was this uh, conscious circle of humanity that was guiding things from afar. You know, Spensky was convinced that uh, it existed and that he needed to get in contact with it himself. And um, at the same time, uh, he didn't know how. And he broke with Gurdjieff because Gurdjieff wasn't, you know, sending him to uh, the, uh, the Himalayas or wherever he thought it was. And uh, Ospensky was a mathematician and he liked everything organized. And Gurdjieff was not organized. And it drove him crazy because Ospensky wanted a system that he could use to teach anybody. And there was no system. So since then, uh, lots of people have hoped to find the inner circle of humanity, have claimed to have found the inner circle of humanity, have claimed to be representatives of the inner circle of humanity, and we wonder what is up with all of this. Is there an inner circle of humanity? Uh, the answer is yes and no. In the way that Ospensky thought secret master is hidden away, no. There is not, never has been, never will be. Why should there be? Are there people who are working for the betterment of humanity, who are teachers of one form or another, who possess some very interesting wisdom? Yes. And can you go out and find them? Maybe. If they claim that they are, they aren't. This is, a, this is an important thing. Um, there was a one charlatan guru back in the 60s, uh, pseudo-Sufi teacher who was like, uh, you know, claiming to be the head of all of the Sufis and all of this stuff. And basically because of the time, um, putting out some serious BS uh, and nobody knew any better and a lot of people bought it because the first person to publish is the one everybody believes and so this guy was out there and, and you know he not only published books under his own name but he published a good dozen books under pseudonyms that were praising him 
which I found particularly amusing. Uh, and then he died and now nobody cares. But uh, it's easy to get suckered into this stuff. Here's the thing. Uh, and the, the Naqshbandis, which is a, a Sufi order, love to do this. Um, anytime you meet a Naqshbandi sheikh, he is the Qatub al-Zaman, the pole of the world, according to him and all of his students. And every Naqshbandi sheikh does this, in, in my experience. I have not run across one who hasn't yet in my life. So what is the significance of that for people who don't know? Okay, so the, this is like the highest person in the conscious circle of humanity, the pole of the earth, the, the person to whom God guides and he sends out his blessings to everybody else on the planet. Um, and it's kind of amusing. Um, and at the same time, um, completely meaningless but people get suckered into this and I think it's it's a way that you can find out how gullible somebody is and the ones who really buy into it you don't want to have anything to do with yep I agree yep but it's, yeah, I mean, that frequently is what happens. People tell these elaborate stories about themselves and people flock to them. So. Yeah, so. Um, in a certain sense, Gurdjieff did that. And yeah. Gurdjieff had incredibly profound teachings and he had some utter bullshit. <laughs> at the same time and I'm pretty sure that he felt that it was your job to sort the two out you know his uh, ray of creation where you know the moon is evolving and getting warmer and will someday hold life is a total fantasy it never has happened it isn't happening. If anything, it's probably getting colder, but it's certainly not going to spring forth into life at any, any given point. Um, and a lot of that he pulled from theosophical stuff, which was equally ridiculous and silly. So Aaron asks, is that tendency for people to, you know, put these people on pedestals, um, is it because of the attachment to titles in part? That's part. And it's also, t human beings want to know and they want to be seen as knowing. And once you think you know, then you are afraid to change that because um, then you're wrong. If I know something, and then I find out that it's not true, then I have to be wrong. And for the ego, this is a terrible thing. We don't want to be wrong about stuff. We don't want to be seen to be wrong. This is why cults proliferate and why they're so successful. Um, and it has nothing to do with the real conscious circle of humanity. Like I said, there is a real conscious circle of humanity. And you may be a member of it. I'm pretty sure that Zainab is a member of it, for instance, because she has some enlightened rugs in her shop. She's over there growling at me probably. <laughs> oh, we have a qu uh, so a comment from Aaron. Seems like a consist uh, yeah a consistent cognitive trap. It really is, and one of the most interesting things about it is that that whole if you publish first, people are going to believe you mm -hmm. uh, is really powerful. 
Oh yeah, I mean, um, I can reflect and think of times when I've fallen into that same trap, so. Yeah, yeah, writing a book somehow gives you gravitas. So like Carlos Castaneda back in the 60s wrote uh, this bullshit fantasy called uh, yeah, the, the Teachings of Don Juan, which if you talk to any native, they would tell you, this has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with you know, Native American peyote tradition or anything. Castaneda made it up. He cobbled it together from a bunch of cool sounding stuff and everybody bought into it. They gave him a PhD for this book, for God's sake, without ever asking, what, where are his sources? Where are his notes? Where are the people who he supposedly interviewed? And having these secret chiefs that you are the only person um, who has contact with is a very convenient way to run this. It, and this, this is not new. Blavatsky did it with her theosophy. You know, the whole, uh, the Mahatma papers that she wrote were all about uh, these, these letters that she got from these secret chiefs in Tibet who were giving her these teachings. And she was the doorway and the conduit to it and nobody else was. And you see this over and over and over again with the hucksters and the, the cheats and the con men in all of this uh, who are claiming they have the, the, they have the secret chiefs in their pocket. Crowley did the same thing. The Golden Dawn did the same thing. Um, it is a consistent archetypal pattern in our culture. And part of the secret to this is that Sufis use this. One oh, do of the, they? Yeah, yes, same they word. do. One of the ways that Sufis use this is that uh, they set it up so that people will go looking for these secret great leaders and leave the Sufis alone to do their work. And we still see that. I, I knew this guy. Uh, we were in the same Sufi group for some time. And he finally left because he wasn't getting the recognition that he wanted. And, you know, he's a psychologist and he's written a couple of books. And I remember catching him in an interview a couple of years ago. And he was like, you know, I was looking for the inner circle of humanity for all of these years. And I've come to the conclusion that it doesn't exist because if it existed, I would have found it. There's something wrong with this logic. And this is something that I learned from my teachers which is if they don't want you, you will not find them. And this guy, if I, I hate to say it, but his ego was bigger than his house. And he thought that he was deserving of these teachings. And the fact of the matter is, is that no one is deserving of these teachings. You either earn them or you don't. So we have this idea of the inner circle of humanity, which are these hidden masters in the Hindu Kush or in the Himalayas or in Central Asia somewhere, and they are holding all of these secrets. And if you're really, really lucky, they'll notice you and bestow them on you. And this is a complete myth. It is a comforting lie uh, crafted so that uh, people who will not do the work can be entertained. And we could tell you stories about the secret masters all night long. Kyle is a secret master. Don't tell them. Sorry. Don't worry, they won't believe me because you're a girl. <laughs> And girls are not allowed to be secret masters. I, I have heard many, many mullahs say this. I've heard the same. Yep. Yeah, so if you were a secret master, you'd have to be a boy, and we would all be sad. 
either way, you know, yep. I'm good. So what is the real story behind this? The answer is yes, there are people in the world who know stuff and they don't hang out shingles and say, oh, look, you can come to my secret monastery high in the mountains and study and you'll be enlightened. But they aren't these all powerful, all knowing, um, super secret dudes. They're just people who know stuff. And not necessarily just dudes, per and se. Not necessarily just dudes, no. My teacher, one of his teachers, was, uh, they, it was actually two, and they were a husband and wife team of healers. Uh, they were Bektashi Sufis. And the, uh, it, the woman was the leader of the group. The man was her, uh, her deputy, uh, but she was decisively the leader. And she was a phenomenal healer and she, uh, within her community, she had great respect and she had her husband for when the mullahs came by and he would go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the dude. But that was just protective coloring for her. So is this sort of, are you guys following this more or less at the moment? I'm following it. I'm not sure I see evidence that there's an inner circle doing much. You're not sure if there's an inner circle doing much? I, yeah, looking at the state of the world, yeah. Yeah, that, that would assume that the inner circle has anything to do with the state of the world, if there were an inner circle. This is one of the things that uh, people make a mistake, like, there is an inner circle of humanity and their job is to help make the world a better place. No, the inner circle of humanity that is actually real is not about making the world a better place. It is not about politics in any way, means or form because they understand that all politics are delusional. And to in, in the old days, the, the rule was never involve yourselves with kings and princes and rich merchants. Stay away from them completely. So Nancy, Alan, uh, Aaron has a question for you. What kind of inner circle are you thinking about? Well, hey, come on. Um, go ahead. My idea of an inner circle is probably influenced by Idris Shah, who, you know, is not a good influence. But, you know, he seems to talk as though they were trying to make the world better. Now, yeah. And Shah was one of those guys who was a gateway, you know. I am the gateway to the inner circle, right? Only nobody ever got there. Okay. I, yeah, I... I didn't get as clear a vibe from about that as you did, but um, you know, if there's an inner circle of people who are working on their own enlightenment, and you know, uh, I can certainly believe that that, that exists. Yeah. Uh, so here's what the inner circle actually looks like: a bunch of regular people who do not have superpowers who are working on themselves and have been working on them, themselves for a long time and have achieved a certain amount of, let's say, clarity. And what they do is uh, imagine that they're on a ship and they all have long boat hooks and they're looking in the waters and every now and again they see somebody who is trying to get out of the water. And so they reach down and hook them with their bolt hook, boat hook and pull them up. They are a rescue group. They are not a political group that is gonna save the world because the world doesn't need saving. 
most of humanity is not going to change. Most of humanity lives in delusion. And they don't want anything other than that delusion. Some people actually want to wake up. And the job of the inner circle of humanity is to keep an eye out for those people. And when they see them, if they can, lend a hand, pull them out of the quagmire and give them a little direction, give them some techniques and see what happens. It does not guarantee enlightenment to anybody, including the members of the inner circle. But there are a series of core teachings that have been, at least on the Sufi side, which is the side that I can speak to. There are a series of core teachings that have been handed down from teacher to student, unbroken for a thousand years or more. I don't know how long, over a thousand years that have to do with the process of rescuing oneself because truly only you can rescue yourself from drowning in the delusions of humanity. Uh, and their job is to like throw you a life preserver. Ospensky never got that. So he went around hoping to find the inner circle of humanity and be let in on the secret. Gurdjieff was, as far as I can tell, a representative of the quote, inner circle of humanity in that he was taught by people who did this and he was sent out into the world to go, hey, you can, you can do this stuff. There, there are ways to wake up. When he died, his job was done, which is why uh, the Gurdjieff movement is no longer viable for the most part. You know, with there were a couple of his immediate students, Madame de Saltzman, uh, J.G. Bennett, uh, and one or two others that seem to have made some serious progress in their work, but I don't think that they have really produced anybody to follow them, yeah, with the exception of maybe Bennett, but that's not how it's supposed to work anyway. One of the things that is most toxic to really waking up is permanent organizations. So if you have uh, a group that claims, you know, you know, we are the priests of Atlantis and we're still here and we're going to give you the special Atlantean teachings. You might want to just take the money that you would spend on them and, and go to a movie. Well, don't go to a movie today because you'll die of the virus, but do something useful with it. Are we following me so far? Mm -hmm. So Aaron, thanks you for your sharing, Nancy, previously, and says, uh, G.I. seemed to be his own teacher in ways that remind me of Musashi. Um, he was his own teacher in some ways, but as he admitted, he spent years going to places and studying. Uh, and he met several profound teachers, uh, not the least of which was in, he refers to him in uh, meetings with remarkable men as the Dervish Boga Adin, which uh, is a sort of bastardiz bastardization of Bahawadin, uh, which suggests that he might have fallen in with a Naqshbandi teacher, or maybe not. Uh, probably not, actually. Uh, for reasons that we don't need to go into, but uh, he had some serious teachers. Uh, not just on, in the Sufi tradition, but in the Buddhist traditions of Tibet, in the Hindu traditions of India. He was all over the place when he was a young guy. Uh, 
he says, Aaron specifies his approach to finding things out. Yeah. Uh. So, so deconstruction of structures or the collapse of organizational structures. Let's return to that. Yeah, because that's important. So, no real school is meant to last more than a couple of generations. It is absolutely necessary for the school to dissolve and recreate itself over and over again. The teaching won't go away, but the form needs to change. If the form doesn't change, you end up with what I like to call museum Sufis. People who have the form of like 10th century uh, Arabs from Iraq or uh, 8th century Persians from Isfahan who dress funny and talk funny and think that they have something, but they don't. And uh, that is not something that is very useful. So in order to prevent that, to prevent the uh, creation of uh, structures and edifices that will outlive their usefulness, uh, schools are designed to uh, be dissolved and to be rebuilt. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. People get uh, really caught in the structure of things, the, the form. Um, I remember um, last year, er, one of the early talks I did was on what I call uh, conscious suffering and intentional work. You remember that? So I get this comment on it from this guy who went, Gurdjieff said intentional suffering and conscious work, which he did. That was how he described it back then, not how I describe it now. The way I describe it works for now. It's for you to understand that the suffering has to be a conscious choice and work has to be intentional. But this guy who was a member of some Gurdjieff school was convinced that I must be completely wrong because I didn't use the terms that Gurdjieff used. Gurdjieff didn't even use the terms that he used. The guy spoke Turkish, he spoke Russian, he spoke English for shit. Uh, and so when he said things, it was really hard, according to the people who were his students, to actually figure out what he was saying sometimes. The only guy who had an advantage with that was, was Bennett, who spoke fluent Turkish uh, and so could speak to, to Gurdjieff in his native language or his first language or what we think of as his first language. Um, uh, could you talk a little please. about, oh, sorry. No, please. Could I talk um, a little about? Um, how, how schools are designed for intentional dissolution. Um, teachers explain to their, their inheritors, first of all, that um, this school is going to dissolve in one or two generations. They may even instruct uh, their inheritor, you need to dissolve this school and then go out and rebuild another one with a, a different name, a different form that will be suitable for the time. So like the nine-sided circle is not like a traditional Sufi school. It's not like a traditional fourth way school. It is like what it needs to be for the people who I serve and who Noor serves. 
And it's, it's interesting because uh, we have two of us to work on this. So our, our expression of the circle is um, it's bigger than any one person now. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have other people who are at a point where they can teach in the school. And then the school becomes even more uh, interesting. Uh, an example of this, uh, and Nancy, you'll find this interesting. Um, Dong Hai Chuan, who brought uh, Bagua Zhang into the world, the martial art of the eight, eight trigram palm, had seven or eight main students. He taught each one of them differently because each of his students were already masters of some other martial art. And so he took what they already had and built on it to create a system for each of them and then sent them out to not, taught, not teach what he taught, but teach what they knew. So it's kind of like that. It's like, Noor is never gonna be me. And that's, yeah. Better looking and shorter. And I'm my own person. I have my yes. own flaws, my own skill set that I'm developing, my own talents. All of those things come into play. And so her expression of the school is going to be different than mine. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we talk about that often. That's not something that we uh stifle we do our best not to stifle that yeah so when i work with my students i want each one of them to be their own person and to go forth and do what they do not what i do mm -hmm. as a matter of fact if you go out and you do what i do i consider that a failing on my part the goal is not parroting you know, no. parrot, bird. And the goal is a perfect expression of your own internal awakening. Not my, not my awakening, not Noor's awakening, not Nancy's awakening, but your awakening. And that's not going to look like anybody else's. And the people who resonate with that will be drawn to you. And that's important to remember. The, the people who come here are people who resonate with the teaching as we put it forth. Mm -hmm. There are other real teachers out there, and I can give you a list of them if you want, uh, that will teach differently than us but their teaching is equally as valid for the people who resonate with them. It's like, you know, um, one of my favorite enlightened guys is Adya Shanti. Uh, you know, a surfer boy who made, made it good uh, and who teaches here in the Bay Area. Uh, totally different than any way that I would ever teach. He is so much nicer than me, almost as nice as Noor. Um, but his teachings, are, they resonate, They're, they are true. Yeah, and that's when you can observe the, the same truths or the same, almost like, well, you know, these, these, sh these shared principles can be shared in very different media, modes, tones, all those things. And you can see that in these teachers who are clearly sharing the same principles and the same ideas and truths and all that stuff, yeah. but they're doing it with their own nuances, their own flavors. Yep, and they're living it as well. That's, that's, the, that's the other piece. important thing. Yeah. Anybody can read stuff from a book. But can they, 
yeah, are they demonstrating it in their own lives and yeah. in, in how they treat others? Yeah, and so if you want to find inner circle of humanity, Adya is one of them. He might be, be pissed if I say that, but it's true. <laughs> Um, Cherie's teacher, Lawrence, is another great example of that. His teachings will not be like mine, but from everything that I know of them, they are absolutely solid and true and are an expression of the um, insani kamo, the, the awakened human being. Um, Eckhart Tolle. There are people who will totally resonate with his teachings, which seem to come from exactly the same place. Never met the guy, but I mean, I cannot deal with his teachings. And yet I know that they're true. If I listen to him for any length of time, I fall asleep <laughs> because he's, he's just does not speak to my particular psyche, but it doesn't mean that I'm not discerning enough to know that he's speaking the truth. There are a whole bunch of people like that, and you find them everywhere. There was a guy, the most enlightened guy I have ever personally met, ran a fast food joint, a burger joint, on um, I-40 in Slagman, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere. Slagman, Arizona is literally a one horse town. One street goes through, you jump off I-40 and then you jump off back on at the other end. Used to be part of old Route 66, but uh, has changed. And I went there and I was in awe of the brilliance, the light emanating from this guy as he slung burgers and made shakes. And he was part of the inner circle of humanity. That's more how it works. Aaron's enjoying the burger story. It was one of the most mind blowing experiences I have ever had walking into this place and going, holy crap, this guy's the Buddha. <laughs> just experiencing the light radiating from him as he did his thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. Anyone can be the Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. So if you meet the Buddha on the road, order a burger and fries <laughs> and a shake. So I love all of that. And we also have an interesting question here. So do you think there is much practical value in preservation of structures beyond posterity? Uh, I think that there, there is a practical value in recording them uh, as one would put exhibits in a museum. Other than that, when a, when a um, expressions time has come to go away, it is no longer valid. What worked in 14th century Konya will not work in 21st century um, Palo Alto. Nope. It won't. You cannot teach the same way. Most, for instance, most of our students are not Muslims. And so that means I, I have a choice of trying to take a non-Muslim and teach them a Muslim paradigm. Or I can speak in a paradigm that they understand without all of the Islamic trappings. And I prefer to do the latter. And this, of course, makes me a heretic because the museum Sufis will say, oh, you must, they must be a good Muslim in order to teach. It helps, but it's not a requirement. I'm sorry. Sufism is not religion. It's science, and science doesn't need belief. 
you can be a Taoist. One of my, my good students is a Taoist. And she doesn't have any tr trouble finding, uh, following what I'm saying. You can be a Buddhist. You can be an atheist. I'm perfectly fine teaching this stuff to atheists because a belief in a religious tradition is not necessary to understand reality. And this is admittedly totally heretical. Um, and yet, disturbingly true. And yes, Aaron, they weren't all that great a burger. You know, when it came down to it, you weren't there for the food. You were there for the enlightenment. The food was just to, to, to get you on down the road. So that's an idea of the inner circle of humanity. Sometimes the inner circle of humanity sends people into the world to gather up those who would like to not drown. And most of those people are not gonna completely make it anyway. Some of them will, because this is hard stuff. And that's, that's the other thing that uh, the hucksters and the con men will more or less promise you the world. They'll promise you great spiritual powers, et cetera, et cetera. The real inner circle of humanity doesn't promise you anything. I will tell you right now, um, just so that we're clear, if you're working along the path that I'm teaching, you're not going to get superpowers. I'm sorry. We don't do superpowers here. If you want superpowers, you've got to go someplace else. You are not going to, you are not going to magically be able to, you know, get what you want or anything like that. We don't do that stuff here. And as far as I know, in my experience with the inner circle of humanity, the real one, none of them do. Superpowers are not a thing. I hope that's not disappointing to anybody. I mean, I admit, when I first discovered this, I was a little bit disappointed. I wanted some superpowers. I wanted to be able to win friends and influence people. Yeah. <laughs> levitate maybe. Yeah, levitation would have been good. Being able to uh, disappear from one place and appear from another miles and miles away would have saved a lot of money on airfare. But I'm sorry, we don't get superpowers. Have absolutely none and no interest in them. What you do get is the full set of human powers, which I personally think are even better. The full experience. Yep. The depth of that full experience. Yeah, so human powers are very, very interesting. And you can only get them by doing the work. Human powers are like seeing what is. That's an incredible human power that I wish more people had. Um, the ability to question one's assumptions, that's a human power. And I have discovered that that is better than levitation. So in the real inner circle of humanity, you get human powers. So basically that's kind of what I got. 
that was what I was thinking about tonight, uh, hoping that you would find it uh, at least amusing. I think it's honest and I think it's direct and it helps people decide whether, you know, it's just the path for them. We all need to discern that at some point. And the potential for any given person being part of that circle of humanity is great, you know, given that if you put in the effort, it's possible to become a deepened human being, someone who really embraces life and experiences it in its fullness and helps others to do the same. So, what do you think? Talk to me. <laughs> talk to Noor if you don't want to talk to me. What are you thinking about saying, Ab? Um... It was clear and yeah, it sits. <laughs> um, I had a question actually. Oh yeah. What Any questions? To... Bring them on in. Um, so what happens when one of these people die? When one of so which people die? The inner circle? Uh, like usually you bury them. <laughs> uh, sometimes you set up a shrine where their tomb is because they will have baraka. They will have blessing associated with them. Uh, if they have trained a successor, then their successor will carry on in one way or another. And if they haven't, their line stops there. Okay. No big deal. I mean, when I die, Noor will take over what I'm doing and she will do it in the way that she does it. And, and that is already foreordained. Yeah. In turn, I may have a successor or I might not. Yep. It depends on what comes up. And her successor may do it differently than we do it because it will be a different time then. You know, when I was learning, the Islamic aspect of this was very, very heavy very rich, very thick into it. Uh, but that was before the, the whole Islamic terrorist and all of this. And nobody wants to hear about Islam. Nobody wants to have anything to do with it uh, in most of the world. So if I emphasize that, nobody listens. I still do it every now and again. And with my fellow Muslims, it is often relaxing and fun to be able to just talk in natural language that I learn uh, of the system. But for most people, I translate it. So they, because like I said, it doesn't have to do with religion, it's science. If you are awake, you are awake no matter what God you might want to burn incense to or no God at all. Or multiple. Yeah, or multiple gods. You know, Buddhism is basically an atheistic religion. Did you know that? It's one of my favorite things about it. Buddhists don't need gods. Buddhists say, yeah, there are gods. They're as deluded as everybody else. <laughs> so I get a kick out of that. Shuri, what's going on for you? Well, I was think, reflecting on what Zainab has asked about what happens when a teacher dies. And I know Lawrence is going to die um, fairly soon because his body is, is not coping very well with its physical state. And it makes me reflect on the fact that stay awake when you get the teaching and apply it to your life because you can't depend 
on calling your teacher anytime you want to. And there's been a, a slow separation where I have come to terms with the fact that when he dies, I said, I won't be sad because I've gone past that. I said, you know, it will be his time. And that makes me think about the teaching that I have received. What am I doing with it? Am I keeping it a living thing by applying it to my life? Not waiting for when I should be applying it or when. It is now, right now. That's what keeps it alive. That's yep. what keeps that teacher alive. There's no special thing, no special shrine, no special token that I have from him. You know, you just pay attention. This is the teaching, unsullied. It is not cluttered with ceremony or frills and spills and bits and bobs. You know, it's just, this is it. Bang. That's it. The end. That's what he always ends some of his teaching. The end. That's it. He's not going to tell you anymore. If you're not listening right then, and if you didn't write it down, it's lost. It's gone. The vibration is going out forever, but you missed it. So pay attention now. This is it. And yeah. if you think, you know, he hits me right between the eyes every time I get to speak with him, which is a, a wonderful blessing. And I say that to him every time because I can hear his voice in my head and my heart. So I can hear, you know, what I should be doing. When some event presents itself, I know how I should respond. And am I, am I going to be courageous enough to do it? especially when someone pisses me off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about happy days. It's not about being happy. You know, it's like, okay, what is the right action? Am I taking right action? Or am I indulging my own human nature, my own ego? That's it. What are you going to do about it? So that's what I do. And it's an ongoing thing. And when that person pisses me off, I just keep remembering the instruction. You love them as they are because you can't fix them. You can't change them. Only they can do that. So love them as they are. But sometimes it means I have to separate and put a different space between us. Oh, yeah. No problem. No problem. Nothing wrong with that. But the demand of, that person has to apologize or make things right in the time that I demand, not going to happen. Might take a day, might take a week, might take a year. And sometimes it's just like, let it go. That person is in that self-indulgent, ego-driven space. Leave it. Yep. Walk in this, <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, these are the teachings we keep with us and that we... Yeah internalized and find ways to act out as we were saying and eventually when the time is right with the right intentions and self-positioning share it with others as well yeah. yeah yeah so really your life is your own living testimony of your teacher mm -hmm. the the capacity to be moved to do the right thing is is wonderful and if you're not moved to take action more learning is necessary <laughs> yep. yeah my teacher said live each day as a demonstration of the teaching anything right. less than that you're cheating yourself hey absolutely yep. So thanks for sharing, Shri. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so there is an inner circle of humanity. The inner circle of humanity does not live in the Himalayas or the Hindu Kush or any place else uh, in particular. They don't hang out for the most part in monasteries. Uh, they don't keep secrets. Um, of my tarika, my teacher used to say, you know, we could be living next door to you and you would never notice unless you woke up enough to see us there. 
And it's true. So the real inner circle of humanity are just the people who are out there working every day to stay awake and to be real authentic human beings. And there are some of them who are keeping an eye out for people who are bobbing along the river of life and would like to get out and maybe not drowned. And that's the whole secret of the teaching. All of the rest of this stuff, all of the secret masters things that uh, people who want your money tell you about are just good stories. They're just myths to keep you entertained. So that's what I got to say for tonight. That's what we got. Yep. All right. So do we have anything else we want to add on the, on the end? Like announcements, thoughts? No, well, we did the announcements at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do your work. Yeah. Whatever it might be. <laughs> Let's all get to work, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to turn off the uh, recorder and we'll see everybody next week. Take care. See you next week. Bye.